You got 30 seconds. Is that officially? What do you have? I can hear the ocean. <laughs> yeah, we got about 20 seconds before we'll All right. get going. Well, come up a little closer, guys. Just like, so you guys know, Vic's there's not going to be any sort of splashing okay. or anything like that. So if you want to come closer, you can. Yeah. I'm rounding up the troops here. Yeah. Or you can just stay back there. and well, whatever. That way you can make a mad dash out if you have to. Well, you might. Yeah. Here, like, yeah, well, you never know. You never know what's going to come out of your mouth. So. Yeah, it's true. It's dangerous. Uh, cool. All right. So, yeah, here we got Fit Teslin. Now, a lot of guys know Vic already. He's a can tool expert. Is that fair to say? I think that's fair to I'm say. I'm all right at it. Yeah. You're all right at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Vic's going to do some showing how to set up your hand planes, uh -huh. talking about these low angle Melbourne tools. Yep. And yeah, so again, on YouTube, now we kind of messed up last time. If you have a question on YouTube, we missed a whole bunch, but we know where to look now. Um, so feel free to ask it. We'll try to get uh, Vic to answer them. Um, and obviously, Instagram and TikTok, same thing. We'll try to watch for that. Um, yeah, take it away, Vic. Awesome. Okay. Welcome, folks. Welcome. Um, and welcome to everybody out in, uh, is that TV land, would you call that? Yep. You think? Okay. So <laughs> that's right. Depends what age you are, I think. Um, all right, so I'm Vic, uh, and uh, amongst uh, other things, I, I've, I've written a couple of books. I've uh, I write articles for magazines. I uh, am working with this company M uh, MTC, which is out of Melbourne, Australia, um, to help sort of um, bring these tools to North America. Um, and my background is furniture design and making, so um, it's hard to make a living uh, selling the furniture that I was making. Um, and so, um, so now I just make it for myself, which is a lot more, a lot more exciting. I think if you have any questions at all, um, uh, please don't hesitate to put your hand up and ask. Um, if I don't know the answer, I'm going to make it up on the spot, but it's going to sound convincing. That's also as good as the jokes are going to get. So if that was disappointing, then you're in for a rough hour. Okay. So. Where are the what's going on with these planes? Where are they from? What's going on? So, in the plane world, um, we've always had really good high end tools, and then garbage, plane like objects that sort of work but not very well. Um, and so, this was realized even more so in Australia because in order to get products down there and wholesale and all that other stuff, you know, a plane like this was costing five, six hundred dollars. And it just it's not a reasonable thing uh, for a lot of people to spend that kind of money on a single plane. Um, so um, we needed something that was middle of the line. OK, I always tell people that I would love to go get my groceries in a, in a Maserati, but it's not going to happen. Right. But my Nissan does a pretty good job at getting me to the grocery store and back. It just doesn't have the flash, right? And so that's basically what these planes are all about. So the folks in Melbourne, what they did was is they uh, hired a product designer and they an industrial designer, and they basically looked at what was done historically with planes. They wanted to do a more modern approach to planes, which is why most of these planes have a bevel up configuration versus bevel down, which is more traditional in the case of the Stanley. Um, the, the plane that Len was using earlier, it was a bevel down plane. Um, there's a little bit more versatility with a bevel up plane, and we'll talk a little bit about that. However, um, they wanted to do things a little bit differently. Um, and then what they did was, is they went to China because the problem with tools that are super high end, they're made in North America. And so you're paying North Americans to make them and that's very expensive. And so then instead of going to a Chinese plane maker, because when you go to a Chinese plane maker, you get Chinese planes, which some of us may or may not have experience with. Um, in this case, what they did is they went to a company that specialized in making uh, scroll chucks for lathes. And if you know anything about scroll chucks, you know that they have to be accurate. You know that they have to be perfectly balanced. And so they understood quality. They understood accuracy. And so they went to them and said, hey, can you make these? 
And so they kind of scratched their head a little bit. There was a bit of humming and hawing, and they said they would give it a try, and they did. And what they came out with was pretty impressive. Um, so they're holding tolerances of three thousandths of an inch, um, which is pretty much the standard for uh, for hand planes. Um, the castings are incredible because they're using investment casting, which is gives you the best quality cast. Um, so it may look like um, that these planes are painted gray, but in fact, um, actually, if we can use this camera here, um, it looks like they're painted gray on the body, but they're not. They're actually just clear coat. So that's the surface that you're getting from the casting, which is pretty incredible. Uh, and then, of course, all of the milling um, and stuff is done really well. The toe is nice and flat, which is always a concern when you're talking about these planes. And then, like, here's another example of the casting. So this is one of the spoke shaves. This has got all metal um, uh, handles. And the quality, the fit and finish of the, of the casting is pretty impressive. And so I really didn't want to like these planes, if I'm being honest, um, because I was used to using quite, you know, high-end planes, and I would also make my own wooden planes. Um, and so I wasn't really, um, I didn't want to like these planes. <laughs> and I think that was just a bias on my own because, um, because I just, you know, I got accustomed to a certain level of plane. Now, um, but when these arrived, I started using them. I basically put away all my bougier planes and I just started using these in my shop. Um, and so the other planes haven't come out of the drawer that I put them in. I've still been using these because they work every bit as well, in my opinion. So um, the nice thing about this, though, is that they're not $350 each, right? The most expensive one right now um, is the Jack. And I think that's what, $220? Like yeah, 220, I think is the, so that's uh, until the jointer shows up, which it's arriving soon. Um, that's a pretty impressive price um, for a tool that works right out of the box. Now the blade, we recommend that you do a final honing on the blade. Okay, it's what we refer to as factory sharp. So that means that it's been, it's been flattened to a reasonable level and it has a very nice grind on it and it will take a shaving. Right. Every time I pull a new one of these out of the box, I try it to see and it does take a shaving as you would expect it to. Um, but we recommend for that last little bit, um, just give it a just give it a bit of a home. OK, so that's how these planes sort of came to be. Um, they just basically they, in Australia, they got tired of not being able to get a decent plane for a decent price. So they fixed it. Um, and I think it's a brilliant idea because it means that more of us can get into using hand planes um, because a lot of people will hesitate to spend, you know, $350, $450, $500 on a hand plane. But if somebody could get one for a reasonable price, um, then I think more people would give it a shot. And so, um, so that's why they sort of came to be. Any questions about that? No? I explained it. Perfectly well then. Good. Excellent. We just believe you. We, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. If you believe me, great. Great. Yeah, right, right. Seems plausible. Probably not lying to us, so we'll be good. All right. Do you ever check the whether the the, the it's ninety degrees on the on the edge of the base? Uh I don't. Um I have uh for my own like because I'm putting my name behind these, I I did check them. Um, most people don't have the equipment to check for square properly. Um, and so it requires a surface plate and a, and a, and a square and a, the square has to be accurate and it can't be like a Chinese or an Indian square because that's not accurate, right? For the sake of accuracy's sake. The thing about, and that's actually, uh, whether or not these are 90 degrees to each other actually isn't really that important, right? The reason why is that when we use it on a shooting board, so this is just, this is a commercially available shooting board, but you can make your own. Um, when you put the plane on the shooting board, and then let's say this is our piece that we're going to cut, right? There's no, there's no guarantee that this, uh, like as I put it together, that it's gonna actually cut 90 degrees, right? Because 
the blade. I don't know if the blade's been adjusted. I don't know, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So when you're using a shooting board, just going to increase my cut a bit here. There we go. So what I'm doing is I'm taking off end grain shavings here. One, two, sorry. There you go. Okay. But I don't know, like, this looks good, right? It looks nice and looks nice and flat and good, but I got to check it. I got to check if it's actually square. And it's not. It's a little bit high on this side, which means I need a little bit more blade at the bottom, which means then I'm going to make a little lateral adjustment. And then I'm going to try it again. Okay? It's not... It's not reasonable to think that you can get it based on the geometry of the plane. Because if you go small enough, there we go, now we're square. Okay? If you go small enough, if you go to a hundred, a hundredth of an inch, thousandths of an inch, ten thousandths of an inch, at some point it's not going to be square. So square is a relative term, right? But some people will be like, well, I can see light. And it's like, well, <laughs> light is really small. Right? Pro, like photons are, they get in the nastiest little places, those guys. And so, um, same thing with flatness of the soul. I'll get people taking a cheap ruler and going, ah, I see light. That's not how you check a plane. Right? You need a surface plate. You need feeler gauges. You need a lot of things, right? That most people don't have. And I can almost guarantee that this plane would be the flattest thing you own in your shop, depending on the type of tooling that you have. So yeah, so I don't I don't check the plane at all unless I'm experiencing some sort of problem. Right? Some people they get the plane and then they start putting measuring tools on it for some reason. And I don't I'm not sure why that is. Um, but they do. And so then they say, oh well I don't think it's flat and I well hold on, have you used it? That's always my first question. Did you use it? Well, uh, no. So how do you know that there's a problem? Well, my my one millimeter thick Chinese ruler, there's a there's a line I can see. Uh, no, no, doesn't work that way, right? So I always use the plane, and I make the assumption that is going to work the way it's supposed to work, right? And then if if for some reason it doesn't, well, then maybe I might investigate it or you know, try something or what have you. But oftentimes when people try to fix a plane that isn't that that they've discovered is not accurate, they end up wrecking the plane, basically. Because like what did they use to then flatten said plane? Right? Oh, I use the wing of my table saw. Ever put a straight edge on one of those? <laughs> Unless you have like an old Wadkin or something that, you know, was made by or for the use of pattern making. It's not that flat. So I always encourage people to sort of give it a shot first. Try out the tool. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, then we can have a conversation about it. And it's going to involve you sending it back to me and me checking it to see that it's good or not good. Right? Okay. Um, so just to backtrack just a little bit, um, we have, at the moment, we have three planes that I would consider bench planes. Okay, we have a low angle jack, we've got a low angle smoother, and we've got a block plane. Some people don't consider the block plane a bench plane. I disagree because a bench plane technically is is tools that would have come out of a craftsman's work box and basically lived on or under the bench. Well, the block plane is always either in my pouch or on my bench. So uh, to me, that's a bench plane. Um, the low angle jack, so if we just talk, if we forget the fact that these are bevel up planes, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But a jack plane is kind of known as the jack of all trades, right? That's how it got its nickname. It basically is long enough that it can flatten boards like quite wide. I can flatten a board that's 20 inches wide with a jack plane. Now, big deal, where does this come into play? Well, a lot of us have a 13 or a 12 inch thickness planer, but we don't have a 12 inch or 13 inch jointer, right? 
And if you know about milling wood, you got to start with a flat surface and a, and a true edge. And then you can go on to the other machines. Then you can go into the thickness planer. If you stick a board that hasn't been jointed through the thickness planer, it's still going to be out of flat. It's just going to be thinner, right? Which isn't, ideally, it's not what we're looking for, right? Unless you just plan on nailing it together and hoping that it just all pulls itself in, right? Um, so I always tell people, like, if you're trying to, like, decide, do I get a jointer? Do I get a thickness planer? I always say, get the thickness planer first. Because for a couple hundred bucks, you can flatten boards. And for years, I didn't have a jointer because this is what I used. Because if I was only going to be able to get a six-inch jointer, well, then I'm only doing six-inch boards, right? Which is not ideal. A lot of times, boards are wider than that. Some people told me, oh, just take the guard off of your jointer and do both, do two passes. And I'm like, don't take the guard off your jointer, please. Okay. There are a lot of people who are missing parts of their fingers because they took their, they took uh, guards off of their joiner. And that's not something you can easily sew back on because what you collect out of the dust collector is basically hamburger and there's just no fix in that. Right. So don't, don't do stuff like that. Right. I'm fortunate in that I have a combination machine where I have a 12 inch jointer on the top and then I flip it up and then I have a 12 inch thickness planer underneath. And then that, that, that's a pretty nice thing to be able to have. But again, that's an expensive option. And I'm not bragging that I have money. I just make poor life decisions. No way. That's... Okay. Um, so <laughs> maybe you're right there along with me, I guess. Um, <laughs> so the jack plane really is the most versatile. If you do have a six inch joiner and you're able to do the edge work and get a nice square edge, that's great because then with the jack, you can come along and clean up the machining marks, right? When you have a jointer, if it doesn't have um, like a helical head, for example, even if it does have a helical head, you're still not, you're still, there's still tooling marks being left behind, right? So I can come along here with one pass of my jointer and just clean up the marks that the machine left behind. And then when I go to put these, like, don't go over and over and over again, because then you're going to wreck what the joiner just did. But one pass will give you a nice, clean surface. And then when you go to glue those together, no gaps, no seams, no nothing. Right? Same thing at the table saw. One side is typically jointed. If you have a table saw, then maybe you would use the other side. Or maybe you have a band saw, and that's what you use to rip. That's what I use. I don't own a table saw. And so that is then I would just clean up what the bandsaw did, right? And then I'm ready to go again. So the jack plane, so we've got flattening, we've got jointing, right? I just showed you how to do the end grain work with a shooting board. And you don't have to buy a shooting board, you can make a shooting board. I've made more shooting, like I, I go places and realize, oh no, I forgot a shooting board. And so I go into the scrap bin and I make a shooting board. Right. This one's fancy and it's uh, it's made out of phenolic. So it's nice and flat and it's got like little rubber feet on it. So that when it lays on there, it doesn't go anywhere. Right. That's nice. But you don't. it doesn't have to be that. Right. It literally you just need a fence and you need two levels. One piece of plywood slightly larger than the other than the deck. And as long the only thing that matters is this relationship. That's the only thing that matters. Even if for some reason, if this got out, right, we can take that up with, well, hopefully we could take it up with the adjuster on the plane. If it's so much so that you can't take it out with the adjuster of the plane, you probably should take up knitting <laughs> instead of woodworking because that's really out, okay? And there's nothing wrong with knitting. I'm a big fan. Okay, so we got flattening, we got jointing, we got end grain work, and in a pinch, if I want to, so I have that set to a pretty heavy cut. But if I don't feel like walking or turning to grab the smoothing plane that's right behind me, because that's a lot of work, right? Then what I can do is I can dial the plane back so that it's taking a less aggressive cut. 
And then what I can do is I can actually take smoothing cuts that are so fine. Ethan, give me that camera, will you? Okay. It's next to nothing. It's like it's like um, fishnet stockings. Maybe you guys don't know about those, but so. And again, this isn't. <laughs> hey, what you guys do on Saturday is your business. I don't care. I'm not here to judge. Um, and this isn't this isn't me trying to show off, right? This is just a sharp blade in a tool that's nice and flat. And if the, if this wasn't flat, if this was like not, you know, as flat as you would think it was, you wouldn't get these shavings. Because then what happens is, is that the blade ends up having to stick out further in order to get the cut. And then you're going to get variations of cut. And you'll know right away if it's not working the way it's working. If you're not able to get a consistently thickness shaving out of a plane, there's probably a hollow spot somewhere on the body or the sole. Okay. And that's where like whenever people, because before, before this came out, the, the best option was to find a um, Stanley plane that was in good, good shape. And then you would have to know how to, um, to flatten the sole, which is no easy task. Right. And so if you ended up with a hollow anywhere around the mouth, you're, you're dead meat. Okay. You can have a hollow here and you can have a hollow here, but you cannot have one anywhere around the mouth because if you do, you're going to end up with the blade having to stick out further and then it's not going to work the way you want it to work. Okay. So, so the jack plane, to my mind, is the most useful because it does the most amount of jobs, right? And unlike a pocket knife, right? Pocket knives are great, but they don't replace a fixed blade, right? Because you, you can have more leverage with a fixed blade. You can, you know, for carving and things like that, you can do it with a pocket knife, but now it's getting a little weird, right? Because there's weak spots. In the case of the jack plane, it does all of these jobs really well because it's just designed to do that. Yes, sir. Why is the bank allowed? That's a good question. That's a fantastic segue to my next point. <laughs> Why are the bevels facing up? Okay. So when you consider the Stanley style plane, okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. There was one right up there, actually. Who's going to get it first? Who's going to get it first? Yeah. All right. So this is a Stanley plane. Okay. Um, this one is uh, is a nice decoration. Okay. Unfortunately, it's made. It was made uh, uh, after World War II, and when Stanley, uh, when the war was over, and this, and then Stanley got uh, basically taken over by the accountants. And then so everything got thinner and cheaper and, and they cut corners and things didn't work as well as they used to, right? The heyday was between World War I and World War II were the best sort of years to get a Stanley. All that to say, the blade in this plane is, the bevel is facing down and the frog, which is the, um, the bed essentially, is positioned at 45 degrees. So that means that this plane can only cut 45 degrees. Now that's not completely true because you can actually put another bevel onto the back of the blade called a back bevel, and that will technically increase the angle of the cut, but then you're messing around with two bevel angles. And if you think keeping track of one is hard, um, add a second and then watch things get exciting in your shop. Okay, so generally, um, these were offered in a 45 degree um, configuration. Okay. And there's no magic to 45 degrees. 45 was a good middle ground, right? We knew that the Japanese were betting their planes at 37 degrees, right? And then the British typically had them at 50 degrees. And so Stanley was like, well, where do we go here? Well, we shoot pretty much down the center, right? 
And so that became the common pitch or the common angle. All right. So what that means is, is that the angle of the cutting angle is 45 degrees, right? Now, when we switch over to a bevel up plane, the bevel is facing upwards. And so there's a little bit of mathematics involved. Okay. I know you were promised there'd be no math, but there is. Okay. So just to be clear, so that's 45 because the bevel is down. And so it doesn't alter the angle coming down from the, the frogel. That's correct. Yeah, the base, the, the flat of the blade is facing upwards. And so the only thing that can dictate its angle is the frog. Yep. Okay. So then when you go to a bevel up design, now the bevel is facing upwards. The bed, typically on a bevel up plane, is around 12 degrees. Okay. In this case, it is exactly 12 degrees. And then the angle at which you sharpen your blade is then going to dictate what angle that plane is. So for example, all of these planes come with a 25 degree bevel on the blade. So you add 25 degrees plus 12, that gives you 37. That's a number we know about, right? That's the one the Japanese use. Because the Japanese taught us that the lower the angle of attack, the nicer the surface you're gonna get, okay? So on calm woods, you know, nice pines, uh, butternut sometimes. Um, uh, what was the wood you were using, Glenn? Um, basswood, okay? That will get, you can plane that with a low angle all day long and it works lovely. You get these beautiful shavings that come out, it's nice. Um, it's also perfect for end grain work because end grain is the toughest cut to make because it's basically all a bunch of packed straws and now you're cutting across those straws and then that's difficult to sort of, to negotiate with a blade that's got too high of an angle, okay? Technically, you can shoot with these, and I have done so, but you're at a much higher angle now, and you notice it. The higher the angle, the harder you have to push, right? And it's not so bad if you're built like I am with a lot of power behind, um, behind the actual cut, but if you struggle, then that's why. The blade's too high of an angle, okay? So comes with a 25 degree blade, good for calm woods, good for end grain, okay? And I always try to go with the lowest blade I can, right? I'll try and see if I can get away with it. If I start to see a little bit of tear out, then I'm gonna switch to the 38 degree blade. The 38 bevel on top of the 12 bed gives us 50. Well, yeah, that's what the British use, yeah? And so that is more of a, everyday angle plane that you would use. I, my smoother typically has a 38 in it, right? Because I don't, I don't, I try not to work crazy woods, mostly because they're expensive. The dust may or may not actively try to kill you. Um, and so, and I like North American woods. I love walnut, I love cherry, I love oaks, I love ashes, I love all of those things. And so I typically don't need to go much further than 38 degrees, okay? With the exception of curly varieties. So if you have curly maple, bird's eye maple, right? Woods that are notoriously prone to tear out, you can then swap in the 50 degree blade. And now the 50 degree blade plus the 12 degree bed, now you're at 62, right? You're heading to the moon at this point. Okay, and the 62, because it's such a high angle, it's acting more like a scraper than it is like a blade. And the scraper doesn't really care what direction the, the grain is going in. Um, a lot of times you can get away with planing against the grain, or if you're working with a material like uh, rosewood that has uh, um, what's called road grain. You know, when you see those woods, they look really cool. They're really stripy looking. Sapele is another one that's like that. Um, well, it looks cool, <laughs> but basically on one stripe, the grain is coming towards you and the stripe next to it is going away. So how do you hand plane that, right? While well, you pick a higher angle, right? Or a sander. Because <laughs> at some point it's going to be like, nah, this isn't working, right? And so you go to your flat master and you do your surface prep that way. Scrapers are, yep, definitely. Scraper is a good way to, to do it. You can go up even higher. And MTC is coming out with a number 80 style cabinet scraper. 
where basically the blade goes from 62, it goes to um, 100, basically the other way. And so now, um, now you're really into a scraping action. Okay, but again, that you're only going to need that for like the most difficult of woods. Once you're done with the scraper, if that doesn't work, sander, because that's just that's your that's your choices, right? Typically, I will typically I will use a hand plane until it doesn't work, and then I'll go to a sander. I won't do the scraper part because it's a lot more laborious. It's a lot heavier work trying to push that. If you're using card scrapers, it's a real nuisance to like because the card scraper doesn't have a sole, and so you can easily accidentally muck out a bit of a hole somewhere where you're trying to remove some tear out and then when you put it's only when you put the finish on do you see that you've made a divot right and then you'll never not see the divot and it will haunt you for the rest of your life we all have a story like that okay um so that's that's the reason why i like bevel up planes because there's a level of versatility there Right. If you get a plane, if you get a jack plane that comes with a 25 degree blade and then you add a 38 degree blade and a 50 degree blade to that. And what are they? They're about forty dollars each, I think. So now for an extra 80 bucks, you then have a different blade to handle pretty much anything you throw at it. Which is handy. Right. It's the same thing with the smoother. OK. The reason I don't recommend people start with the smoother is because this thing's really a one trick pony. All right. And it's funny because this is the same thing as this, right? And every second woodworker has this as the logo for their business, <laughs> right? The smoothing plane. Everybody's got a number four. Um, and so, you know, you can see this is not, this doesn't have a flat side. Wouldn't be a good, wouldn't be a good shooter. Um, the smoother basically is a 150 year old random orbital sander. That's what this was for. This thing would be set up with the super sharpest blade you could get your, like that you could create. And you would take nothing but super fine shavings with it just to clean off the road dirt that you've created. Pencil marks, um, you know, little little bumps and dings from or or dirt from your hands if you've been working with hardware and stuff. It was just that final bit of work that you would do before you applied finish. Now again, 150 years ago, finish was pretty simple, right? It was it was linseed oil, shellac, wax, or sometimes a variety of them blended together. Like sometimes you would get varnish, which was like a bit of a resin and oil, right? You'd have oils that were, were called long oils, which basically had more oil, less resin. And then you had short oils, more, less oil, more resin, right? But that was your choices. Nowadays, if you walk into the finish department of a, of a store, right, you don't know what to do, okay? So just be aware that if you do use some of the more modern finishes like Osmo or um, what's the two part one? Um, Monocote. Okay. Those finishes don't stick very well to a hand plane surface because the surface is actually too smooth. And so you don't get good adherence. So what I tell people to do is, is go ahead and use the plane to make sure that you get all your milling marks off and get everything all set up and the sole will keep it flat. Yeah. And then just take a hand block with some 180 grit sandpaper and just scuff the surface so that you have that mechanical adherence with the, with the finishes. But if you're going to use shellac, if you're going to use wax, if you're going to use linseed oil, double boil, use double boil linseed oil. Don't use raw linseed oil. It never dries. OK, every time you put your hand on it, you'll, you'll stick to it. OK, so it needs to have something in it that makes it dry. Right. But um, just be aware that some of the modern finishes won't take to a hand plane surface that well. OK. And then, of course, we got a, is there any questions at all? Go ahead and interrupt me. You don't have to don't feel bashful. I mean, if you come here and don't learn something, then I think. 
I think there's, I think you should be here <laughs> and I should sit down and have a coffee. Um, okay. Uh, how am I doing on time, Ethan? You got about 25 minutes. Ooh, okay. Nice. Oh, <laughs> got lots of time. We'll have time. We'll have time for my end of show juggling act. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people like watching that. Open up the blades. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than the next guy's doing axes, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, block plane. Everybody wants to start with the block plane because it's little, it's small, it's cute, it doesn't cost a lot of money. But it's actually a very specialized tool. Okay. A lot of times my block plane only gets used for doing end grain work or for removing the arises on, on boards. So the arises is where two flat surfaces come together, right? So with a block plane, I can let me get this set up here. I can do a round over in five passes. Okay. So I do three at 45. One two, three, and then I do one at 22 and a half, roughly. It does, yeah, <laughs> I know. I was just testing to see if you had your calibrated eyeballs in, okay? And so now what I've got, oh, it's hard to see with this camera, but you have a little bit of a round over, but not enough that you've made it doughy looking. And so if you are using maple, and you leave the, mater the material as milled, you will cut yourself on it, I promise, okay? We've all done it, and it's equivalent to a cardboard cut, right? And those smart, hurts, okay? So being able, and then there's your little shavings that you get from it, okay? They're cute too. And so I agree. Um, so being able to just quickly knock off the corners, right? Oftentimes I'm using this plane one-handed, right? Just to take some of the some of the corners off. Okay, if I'm using a, a regular wooden pencil and I need a specific shaped tip, like a chisel tip for marking like dovetails and stuff, I will take my block plane and I will sharpen the pencil to that angle so that I have a nice big flat to register up against as I'm working, okay? Um, this stuff, like a hand plane will cut plastic, right? I wouldn't use it to cut non-ferrous metals. It technically can, <laughs> but you're going to have to buy more stones because you're, because you're going to, it's not going to be pretty. Okay. And that's why bench dogs typically are made out of brass and not steel. Because if you accidentally hit a bench dog in brass, it's not going to completely destroy your blade only a little bit. <laughs> All right. So that's, so that's good to know. So a block plane, again, very useful. Oftentimes it lives in that pouch, right? Because as stuff is coming out of the machines, I just quickly take the hard corners off. And then as I'm handling it, I'm not having to worry about it. Also, when you take the hard corners off, you, don't, you get less likelihood of splintering. If something, you know, hits that by accident and then it raises off a big splinter, right? Then, then you're kind of stuck, right? Then you got to do the iron trick, you know, the iron trick, right? You take a wet cloth, you put it on the dent, and then you put the hot iron on it and it swells up, but don't grab mom's iron. Because <laughs> you will pay the, you, <laughs> brave man with her not sitting beside you. <laughs> so go to, go to Value Village, buy an old, I try to find the old 1970s ones, you know, that are no longer considered safe. <laughs> Those are my favorite ones. Yeah. And I put wheels on it in case, like, just to make it even more unsafe. Um, but yeah. So, block plane, fantastic for that. Okay. So, these are kind of like the staple sort of planes that everybody can use, whether you're working in a shop that has machines or if you work hand tooled only, right? Some people do that because they enjoy the lack of noise, the lack of dust, right? They enjoy the process. I've worked with um, Canadian vets who have uh, PTSD, and in a lot of cases, loud noises will, will trigger them because of, of what they've gone through. They don't have that problem with these. And so they can woodwork. They can still 
because woodworking for me is like a therapeutic thing. I enjoy it. It calms me. It makes me feel better. Some days if I'm stressed out, I'll just go out downstairs and make some shavings in the shop and then I feel better. Okay. Where do you put the batteries? The batteries for these? Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, wireless. <laughs> yeah. 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 The batteries are the, are the, uh, are the cookies that are over there. That's what fuels this thing. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the plain blade material, like the different materials? Yeah, the yeah. So the plain blades um, on these planes are made out of what's called M2. And so if you're a turner, uh, you probably know about M2 because it's a very common tool steel used uh, for turning tools. Um, now, a lot of people think that's overkill for a bench plane. But when you consider where these planes were developed in Australia, if you've ever had the opportunity to work on Australian woods, you know that basically Australian trees are a form of rock that grows from the ground. Very hard, full of silicate, and will destroy most plane blades, right? And that's why they went with the M2. Now, a lot of people worry about whether or not you, how easily you can sharpen M2. It's no more difficult than any of the other alloys that we typically see in bench planes. Uh, A2 uh, is a common bench plane iron material, high carbon steel or O1. Uh, uh, Veritas has their PMV11. These are all various alloys. Um, and whether you're whatever you're sharpening with, whether it's sandpaper, oil stones, water stones, diamonds, power stropping tools, it'll work the same no matter no matter which you have. Okay. So that's the that's what they're made out of, um, and they take an edge well, and they and they stay they stay sharp for a pretty good amount of time. When I was I did a couple of woodworking shows, and the planes were sharp when I started, and they were still sharp at the end of the weekend. So the the first time we opened the box, and uh, normally I kind of flatten the back of the blade. Uh huh. Uh, do I need to spend any time on? Yeah, you'll spend a little, so it's very typical, like when you first get a plane, um, unless it's uh, like, unless the blade is something like from Blue Spruce Toolworks, where they lap everything flat or Veritas laps everything flat. Okay. In this case here, these are machined flat and it won't take you very long to bring it up to a good shine. Right. And then, uh, and then you just do your bevel the way you do your bevel. So for example, in the case of a smoothing plane, you would have a little bit of camber on it, right? In order to get the corners out of the work, right? Otherwise, if the corners are still in the work, then you end up with beautiful plane tracks that go through your work and that gets frustrating, right? Um, and so typically I will put cam a little bit of camber on a smoothing plane, right? Because I want as much blade as I can. I'm more aggressive with the camber on the jack plane because typically that's doing heavier work right? So I want to be able to do that. Um, and then the block plane, oftentimes I will just take the corners off a little bit, just in case I want to use it for um, like a little spot area. That's another cool thing that you can do with the block plane is that if you've got like a little troublesome area here, you can like just work locally in that area to try to work it out. It's like an eraser. Okay. Same thing if you have like any sort of inlay work, Right, or if you put a, a cap on a screw and you want to like plane that flush, that's a great option for that. And so these three planes come with the different angles of blades. So the 25, the 38, and the 50. You can get that for each one of these. There's another plane that's on its way here right now, uh, and it's a jointer. The jointer is quite long. It's about 22, 24 inches. And so the longer the plane, the flatter, the work you can do with it, okay? But if you are using machines, you probably don't need a jointer because those machines will do the flattening for you. We just know that they won't create a great surface. And so you need to fix the surface with something, okay? Uh, with your referring to the atmosphere of steel, mm. uh, as a wood turner, I was told that M2, when it's sharpened on the micro, uh, microscopic uh, of the cutting edge, that is actually equivalent to carbide. Interesting. And 
if you hit stone because it's so fragile that it will chip quickly. Okay. But I find I get like 10 times the amount of blades out of my sharpening than I would with carbide or anything. Right. Yeah. I mean, that could be true. I, I'm not 100% sure because I, I, I'm not a metallurgist. Uh, I'm just a woodworker. And so um, I know how hard this stuff is <laughs> and I know how it behaves. But as far as metals go, I just have to take the uh, take their word for it. Uh, but I do, like you said, I do notice that they last longer uh, than your typical high carbon steel. So, so when you get a blade, uh, get a, a plane that comes with the two blades, they're all M2. Yeah, they're all everything's M2. Yeah. Okay. Yep. There's no there's no options for other blades at the moment. I would actually prefer that there was a a high carbon steel option, uh, only because that's my favorite blade steel. You have to sharpen it more often, but it takes a super keen edge. And so, because the the size of the carbide in high carbon steel is very very small, and so and very homogeneous, so you get a nice nice fine edge. Okay. All right, so those are the bench planes. Then we get into some more specialty sort of tools, okay? Um, these are spoke shaves. How am I doing? 15. 15, all right. These are spoke shaves. Um, it, as the name suggests, they were designed to shave spokes, okay? So when we used to make our own wheels uh, on, our, on our carriages, this is what you would use to bring them into round right and so where you see these used a lot is chair makers okay um, if a chair maker isn't using uh perfectly round legs like that you would get off a lathe um, they want something maybe that's octagon shaped or something that's a little more oval shaped or something like that these tools can make very short work of um of that kind of stuff okay um in this case here these ones are a little different ethan if i can get the other camera so these ones are a bit different in that they typically would have a wooden handle here, okay? These are all cast, right? And then what they've done is they've inlaid the handles with a bit of cork. I have to admit, the first time I thought of that, I was like, that's a little cheesy, right? But it's actually quite nice because you can actually feel the gift. And so it's actually quite comfortable to hold on to. Um, one of them is flat. And the other one has a little bit of a curve on it, okay? The flat one is designed for doing um, convex work. And then the round one is for concave work. So inside curves versus outside curves, okay? Um, the, other the other place where these get used a lot is in the case of freeform work. So if you want maybe your work to be a little bit more sculptural looking, right? You can use the spoke shaves. If you want to make a canoe paddle, right? A pair of these, they're going to be your best friend, right? And an ax, and you'll be all set, all right? So um, those are spoke shaves. Then we have a couple of routers, okay? Now, this doesn't look like a regular router because it doesn't have a universal motor, and it doesn't and it doesn't spin at a uh, squazillion rpms okay this is kind of what routers looked like before all of that and so in this case here though you're probably familiar with traditional router planes that have an l-shaped blade right and um have you ever, has anybody ever tried to sharpen one of those yeah it's a bit of a nuisance isn't it yeah so because you can't put it flat on a stone you can't it ha you have to hang it off the edge of the stone in order to get it to go right. And then, like, there's no nothing preventing you from rocking it by accident. And whenever you see a vintage one of those blades, it looks like it looks like a dome, right? Because it's been sharpened incorrectly, okay? In this case here, what they did was is they realized, so this is just the stop. I'll take this off of here. Like, why can't the blade just be like a regular blade? So instead of the blade going in at 90 degrees and then your cutting surface jutting out this way, they're like, why don't you just make it like a regular plane and have it bed at an angle? And it's like, oh my gosh, how awesome is that? Because now 
you can sharpen this blade um, very, very easily. You don't like whatever you use to sharpen, like a jig or a Tormac or whatever, like this is going to, this is no problem at all. Right. So that's, that's the good thing about, about these, these planes. And I don't know why, like when I first saw it, I was like, that's genius. Like, why has it been these other blades all this time? Right. I can't think of why it would be. And I can only think of maybe like back in the blacksmithing days, that was an easy way to mount a blade in that orientation because the body was made out of wood. Right. And so you would make the blade that way. And then you didn't have to worry about creating a angled bed, you know, which would have been problematic and all that other stuff. So like this, this works super well. Depends on the work that we're doing with this. So if you, let's say, had your mortise on like a very narrow piece of wood, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how far this would extend beyond the, the center of, of where you're holding it. Right. It, it might extend to, like, it just depends what you're doing. Right. The other thing I noticed with the other style of blade is that when you did get it deep into a piece of wood, man, would it chatter. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in this case here, you get very little chatter. Um, and so, for example, where would you use this in a modern shop, right? Well, if you cut a dado and you had, for whatever reason, had to make your dado slightly deeper, right? But you've already torn down whatever machine you were using to cut your dado work, whether that was a, a dado blade on a table saw or a router table or whatever you used. If you try to set that all up again and get it to match, it's never going to work, right? And so this will allow you to just quickly and easily do that. As well... Um, it comes with the bibs and bobs here to basically attach a fence so that now you can work off of an edge and cut a groove to match that, like to, to position it exactly where you want it on the board. Okay. And that just, they just use like a, a hex key, a hex wrench to attach that piece on there. And then it also um, allows you to loosen it here. And then you can make your little adjustment and then tighten it back up. And now it's nice and secure. Do the blades come on different fits? They sure do. Um, so the large router plane comes with a half inch blade. And then there are five other blades in Imperial or in metric, depending on what you want. So because these tools are designed in Australia, they design them in metric first because they're sensible, okay? Uh, it's only us over here that uh, are still using the king segments of the king's foot. Uh, I don't know which king uh, it is. And thankfully it doesn't change every time we get a new one because Elizabeth had really small feet and I'm sure Charles, if anyway, let's not get into that. Um, same thing with the small router, you get uh, different blades as well. So, um, and then everything is packed in this foam, in this closed cell foam, so that you can actually like, you can use that foam in your toolboxes and stuff like that to hold the plane so that it doesn't go anywhere. Right? So when these things arrive, they're packaged like they can't move. They can't move in the box because they have like a French bit cutout for the tool itself. Okay. And in the case of here, um, they make a tray for the router plane blades because you can have multiples of those, right? So are they sold individually? Or are yeah, you can. So you, when you buy just the plane, the small plane, you get a six mil blade, right? Quarter inch and then, uh, or a half inch, 12.7, okay, mil. Um, and then you can choose to buy singles after that, or you can just buy them as a kit of five. Okay. Usually when you buy them as a kit of five, of course, there's a discount um, to be able to do that. Okay. So why would you choose one over the other? This is designed for a little bit heavier work, right? It has the handles on it so you can kind of hang on with the old all-around kung fu grip. Okay. And then um, the smaller one is actually lovely for doing inlay work. All right. Especially when you strap in that little one millimeter blade, okay? That can do very detailed, delicate work, 
all right? And so um, so this is, and the same thing with the way you're holding it, right? This is encouraging you to sort of like put your hands like on, like all of these have like a nice little uh, cove shape to it so that you can really easily just control it, move things one way, move things the other way, right? Whereas this one, it's a little bit more of a, a little heavier of an operation. Okay. Are the blades interchangeable? No, the blades are not interchangeable because the base of each blade is actually a little wider than the um, than the blade's final thickness. Um, and then, and it's the same thing with this one here. So, if the largest blade here is twelve point seven, well, the body of this blade is probably thirteen mil. Never actually checked it because I don't care, but. That just means, though, that I can't take this and put it into this body because you would need to have a much wider. Yeah, you would have. Yeah. Uh, I suppose suppose you could put the smaller one in there, but then you would need a filler piece to hold it up against and they would become a little bit of a nuisance. So I don't know that that would work as well. Well, if you're doing the inlay, are you wanting about an edge guide on the small one? Oh, yeah. If you need an edge guide for doing inlay on here, all I do is I put a piece of masking tape. And then I uh, take a small piece of wood and I put a piece of masking tape here, CA glue, glue that on, and then there's my, there's my fence. And I don't do any damage to the plane because I can just rip that off and take the tape off and life is good. On a traditional rudder plane, do they make <laughs> blades that small? Um, like that I, one millimeter? It just seems tiny to me. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think Veritas makes smaller blades that are about that size range, um, but I, I I don't know. It's been a while. You got three minutes. Three minutes. Before my question on YouTube, um, she just said, after you sharpen, do you remove the fur? Uh huh. Good question. Okay, so Ruby had a question on YouTube asking about sharpening, um, and so when you do the bevel of the blade. Whenever you do one side, the other side is going to have a burr. You're going to raise a burr. And so you have to remove that burr on the other side. What I do is um, I, I sharpen it, and then I don't take the burr off until my final stone. Because if I take it off on two cores of a stone, number one, I'm going to remove the polish that I had on the back, and then also... If it's too aggressive, you can end up ripping the burr off, and then you end up with a serrated edge, which will translate into your work. Okay. So, those are the planes. Those are how I use them in my shop. Um, I think it's a. I think being able to finally have a well-priced option for a plane that works out of the box. Um, that's a good thing because we haven't had that before. And so now we do. Um, questions? No questions? Okay. If you want to talk to me after, um, after we're done, um, what's coming up next, it involves goats. So I encourage you to stick around because it's going to be fun. Um, what? <laughs> Oh, is that not I know you're promising people, but it's not that. <laughs> okay, there's no goats. There's no goats. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, everybody's leaving. See? Yeah, no, yeah. I should have left about that. <laughs> well, thank you, Vic. Um, so we're going to close down the YouTube live here. So you guys will be kicked off in a moment. Uh, but it'll be reactivated around just before 2.30. So you can watch Mike Davies then. Uh, thank you, Vic. That was great. Thanks. All right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, was it? Read the words. Yeah. I didn't even I consider that. I did not know that. Studying. So when the biggest gentleman was holding up the diamond stone packaging, you couldn't read it. Everything was backwards. Interesting, but well, I don't know if that's how sometimes it's set a setting called mirroring. Yeah, I wonder so if it that. mirrors, then it's going to be reversed. If you take right. mirroring off, then it's going to be front ways. 
Huh. Thank you for mentioning that. I probably won't be able to fix it this round, but next time I'll... The next round will matter, because it's going to be like baby's camera video. Yeah, add it to your checklist. Yes. No, checklist, that's good. Yeah. I didn't even realize that. It's like a fighter pilot. Yeah. <laughs> All the... That's my next book idea. <laughs>